In our last talk, we saw a detailed discussion and comparison of regression and neural network technique applied to electric load forecasting. Our next speaker is Professor Tharam Dillon from La Trobe University in Australia. Dr. Dillon has worked in the area of neural network and machine learning for more than 20 years. He will present his perspective on the international activities in electric load forecasting. In this segment of the tutorial, we're going to be talking about short-term load forecasting from an international perspective. Uh, the, the segment of the tutorial was put together by four people, uh, w two of whom are from Australia, one from Switzerland, and another one from France. When we talk about load forecasting in a power system, we are really talking about several different problems. You could talk about load forecasting for a few minutes ahead, up to 24 hours or 48 hours ahead, up to six months or a year ahead, and up to 10 years ahead. Each of these problems play a different role. For example, the one for 24 hours to 48 hours ahead plays a very important role in short-term unit commitment. The one for six months to a year ahead plays a very important role in maintenance scheduling and intermediate term hydrothermal scheduling. The one up to 10 years ahead plays a very important role in power system planning. In this tutorial itself, we will concentrate specifically on the problem of short-term load forecasting for up to 24 hours ahead. The, these problems have been previously tackled using a variety of methods before one considered the use of neural networks. Specifically, we find four classes of methods. The first of these is the statistical methods. In these statistical methods, what we basically do is we look at a time series from the past. Using this time series, we try to predict an extrapolation of that time series into the time horizon that we are interested in. And there are a variety of techniques which go under this category of statistical methods. They include orthogonal function techniques, spectral expansion techniques, Box and Jenkin methods. The second class are the regression or causal methods. Here, instead of relying on just extrapolating the previous time series, we make the assumption that there is a cause effect relationship between various parameters, such as weather parameters, temperature, wind velocity, and other parameters, and the load. And we then try to develop a representation of this causal relationship. And this, this class of methods are largely known as the regression methods. The third class combine a statistical method with a regression method. That is, they do extrapolation of the time series as well as utilize some causal relationships. And the fourth class of methods largely consists of individual methods such as state estimation, pattern recognition, and heuristic evaluation. Researchers have previously addressed several different load forecasting issues. When forecasting load, one could talk about forecasting the peak load, or the total load, or the actual load during each hour of the day. And uh, in the short-term load forecasting, if you look at the research work that's been previously done, you find that researchers have addressed each one of these problems. What is fairly important to realize is that when we talk about applying neural networks to the load forecasting problem, we have actually now reached the stage where it's moved outside of university laboratories into the field. 
and we see quite a large number of utilities and manufacturing companies which are co-sponsoring field work utilizing neural networks for carrying out short-term load forecasting. Let me just name a few. I think you've already seen a presentation from Pacific Gas and Electric Company. But among others are ABB Systems Control, Harris Corporation, Tractor Bell, Toshiba Corp, Puget Sound, Power and Light, Fuji Electric, ABB Netcom, EPRI, and EDF. So we can see that when we are looking at the issue of load forecasting, we are now no longer talking about something that's in the future. It is here and now. It is you know, going into a variety of field studies and their actual utilities using these for carrying out their everyday load forecasting. Now, in order to understand some of the issues involved in load forecasting, it is fairly important to look at some actual load curves. Specifically, let me point out some of these curves which uh, we have, which shows a typical a, a, a US utility, a French utility, uh, a urban and a rural zone in Switzerland. Now, the thing that should strike you, first of all, just looking down these curves, is the very different shapes of load curve that you can, in fact, get, all right? You can get very different load uh, curves even in the same country, for example, in Switzerland, which is a fairly small area in an urban area and in a rural area. You also get very different load curves in summer, in, in winter and in summer. Now, the other thing that you will notice is that the change of load shape can also be quite different going from winter to summer. You can see that in the US, you get a very pronounced uh, flat periods in, uh, in summer due to a heavy air conditioning load, which you don't find in, to the same extent in France. So there's, there's a very large number of factors which go into making these load shapes. And every utility that is going to, in fact, address this issue is going to have to examine its own load curves, is going to have to examine the sorts of factors which go to making up these load curves. Now, one of the first attempts to use neural nets for, uh, for load forecasting was actually carried out in 1975 by Dylan and some co-workers using single layer perceptron. And what they were looking at was an hourly load forecast from 24 to 48 hours ahead. If you look through the very considerable literature on load, short-term load forecasting, you see a variety of different networks, neural networks, that have actually been used. Among the ones that have actually been used are the multi-layer perceptrons, recurrent nets, and self-organizing feature maps. In order to understand the many different ways that neural nets have been used for short-term load forecasting, we have divided the different classes of nets into six broad architectures. And these are shown in the diagram. That's, uh, and these are shown in the accompanying diagram. They include a multiple input single output system, which is the system A, a multiple input, multiple output system, which is the, the figure B, and then a cascaded correction artificial neural net where the net F11 carries out an initial prediction and F21 carries out an additional correction. The day type multiple input, multiple output, which is shown in figure D, and the hourly block multiple input single output, which is shown in E, and the hierarchical or not fully connected 
artificial neural network, which is shown in F. I'd like to specifically focus on D and E. If you look at those nets, what they are saying is F1 is predicting the 24 hourly outputs for a given day, and F2 is predicting the 24 hourly outputs for a second day, and so on till you get up to FD. In contrast, in E, what you're doing is you're predicting the output for a given hour in the day, maybe the first hour. F1 might predict the output for the first hour, and F2 might predict the output for the second hour. So you notice the outputs in E involve only a single hourly output load, while in D, they involve 24 hourly outputs. What's uh, fairly important in looking at uh, these use of neural nets is to look at the data on the input information and the as associated target outputs. Now, the most widely used net is the multilayer perceptron with backpropagation. And, the, and there are a variety of improvements that have to be made to the net before it can be utilized for short-term load forecasting. One of the mistakes that has been made by some practitioners and some researchers is to try to use the net in a very naive fashion. They just select a set of features, they feed it into a backpropagation net, they produce an output, and then they expect that this would perform the load forecasting that they need to do. In fact, if you proceeded down that track, it's very likely that you will be disappointed with the kinds of results you're likely to get, unless your load is very well behaved. There are a variety of factors which need to be taken into account, and as we proceed with this segment of the tutorial, they will become clearer. If you look at the actual input data that's used for short-term load forecasting, then one of the issues that you need to do is you need to select uh, the type of input data that's being used. And data that's frequently used is temperature, and it may be the temperature today or the temperature for the previous three days. It may be the maximum temperature. The other one is the type of day, whether it's a you know, weekday, whether it's the beginning of the week, the end of the week, or whether it's a weekend. The third type of information that's very important is weather data, rainfall, wind velocity, cloudiness. All of this affect the way that, uh, that the consumers out there use, uh, use electricity and therefore impacts the actual load generated. Another important issue is the length of the training se sequence. Should one use a long time series for learning, or should one use much shorter learning sequences? Now, in order to decide which of these we should use, it uh, maybe if we reflect back on the difference between the curves that we saw for summer and for winter, we realize that the curves over, are going to change over a period of time. And uh, these curves actually reflect, in part, consumer behavior. Let me kind of explain this by considering a very simple example. If you look at a 10 degree rise in temperature in summer, then it's very likely that the air conditioning load will increase following this 10 degree rise in summer. And hence, we would see the actual short-term load for that, for that hour, in fact, rise sharply. In contrast, if we looked at a 10 degree rise in winter, we would probably see the heating load reduce. So the 10 degree rise in winter will be accompanied by a reduction in load. So we can see that a similar uh, change in temperature that's a 10 degree rise in temperature, has a different effect in summer and a different effect in winter. 
this difference in, uh, in impact of different factors over different parts of the year indicates that the load series, it's not stationary. It tends to be uh, the impact of a particular factor is going to be determined by when in the year it occurs. Since this load is actually reflecting consumer behavior, we have to be careful that we are not using time series which reflect behavior which is no longer applicable now. For these reasons, it's important that we keep the uh, time series at an optimum length where we are still able to capture behaviors that are applicable now. On the other hand, if we made the time series too short, we may not have enough information to learn into the net for the net to be able to understand exactly what's happening. So there's kind of two conflicting requirements. One is we'd like to extend the time so that we had more information to learn into the net. And B, we have to sort of make sure that length of time is not so large that we are learning behaviors that are no longer applicable. If you look at uh, various um, actual studies that have been done, the number of neurons in these studies tends to vary significantly. We find that in some studies, we have as few as three inputs. In other studies, we have as many as 32 inputs. In some studies, we have separate outputs for each R. In other studies, we have, uh, you know, the 24-hour day coming off the net as several outputs. Again, if you look at the studies, you find that the hidden layer nodes vary from 2 to 10. Again, the actual number of hidden layer nodes that you would use for your particular system will have to be determined by a series of experiments that are carried out for your particular system. The actual data for learning varies. Choosing data for certain day types, for example, if you felt that uh, Monday and Friday were different from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you might like to segment data from Mondays and Fridays and learn that separately. Limiting the time interval for learning and most significant, choosing most significant cases from a large data set. Now we have currently no analytical way of determining how correct the prediction is from an ANN-based system. So the only way we can actually carry out an evaluation of the accuracy of the solution is by carrying out a series of experiments on quite a large amount of data. Now, four different accuracy measures are employed in, in some of these studies. Specifically, we can look at the mean absolute deviation from the predicted load or the root mean square deviation over the entire time interval, or we can look at the maximum error or the average error. Some typical values that were obtained in a Segre report indicate that the mean absolute deviation in the studies fell between 0.85% to 3.4%, and the RMS error between 1% to 4.3%. Now let us quickly look at the, um, the net itself. Um, here, what I'm showing in this slide is a single layer of the net. So you can look at the output neurons, the activation function, and uh, the output coming out of this particular layer. Now, the uh, when utilizing this, you will of course not use a single layer, but you will cascade these layers and we'll see how that works out uh, in a later slide. The issue that's fairly important to separate is to look at the idea of supervised and unsupervised uh, training. Because one very important division which we can make in looking at these load forecasting studies is to look at the situations where we've used supervised learning 
and where we have used unsupervised learning. Essentially, in supervised learning, what you do is you get, you get given an input point and the output that it maps to. So for every single pair that you have in the training set, you have the input point and the output class. And you utilize these uh, in a supervised way. So the idea of supervised indicates that you've got a teacher which tells you which output the single input point maps to. With unsupervised learning, you can have, you get given the input points and you can have two situations. In the one case, you, can, you know what the output classes are. You have the input points, but you don't know where these input points actually map to. In the second case, you may not even know the output clusters, let alone know which, what any single input point maps to. Now, in previous segments of this tutorial, you have seen uh, various um, speakers outline how the uh, different versions of the nets are used for carrying out supervised and unsupervised uh, learning. We talked about a single layer just a little while ago. Now, what I talked about when I was talking about a single layer is one of these here, okay? So what I'm showing here is a net with three layers, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. Now, a single net like that is capable of modeling uh, any uh, degree of nonlinearity. There are, in fact, a series of results which show this net is capable of modeling any kind of nonlinear, any kind of continuous nonlinear function, provided it's got at least three layers. If you carry out supervised learning with such a net, then you essentially use a backpropagation rule. And this backpropagation back rule calculates in the forward pass the error which is generated, and here the term tk refers to the target value, and ok the output generated by the net itself. What you would like the net to do is produce an output which is exactly the same as the target input. And in order to do that, you look, what we'd like to do is adjust the weights, so you carry out a, a essentially a steepest descent step which adjusts the weight using the gradient of the error with respect to the weights. In the study that we actually are going to talk about in this segment of the tutorial, we will look at several causal factors. The causal factors that we'll look at are indicated in the slide above. And they include temperature of the current hour and the current day, the average temperature of the pre previous day, the maximum temperature of the current day, and the minimum temperature of the current day. It also includes values such as wind velocity, rain for the past three hours, rain for the past 24 hours, a sky condition indicator, day of week indicator, wet or dry day, and a current hour. Except for two of these, which is the day of the week indicator and the current hour, which are discrete values, all the remaining values here are in fact continuous values. In using this for the study, the first thing that you have to do is actually normalize the values. And the expression used for normalization is shown above. Some typical values that were used in this study, which used data from the State Electricity Commission of Victoria in Australia, are shown in the table which is indicated. One very important thing which we did in this study was to um, use a defined block size for learning. And uh, when we use this defined block size for learning, we used a variable, uh, we used a fixed sequence of 20 days for this particular utility for learning. And uh, so we minimize the error for the given block size. 
Once, for example, the first block size could be the days 1 to 20, and on learning the weights for this uh, 20 days, a prediction was made for the 21st day. Then a different block of examples is learnt. In other words, day 2 to day 21 is learnt, okay, and that is then used to predict day 22. And a prediction is again made. In this way, what we are doing is we are unlearning the earlier day. Okay, we are unlearning the first day when we're going from day 2 to day 21. This allows us in part to cope with not, not keeping behaviours which, which are no longer applicable. The actual uh, movement in the learning is shown by uh, this slide here. You see here we learned from days 0 to 20 and we predict the 21st day. Here we learn from days 1 to 21 and we learn the 22nd day. Notice since day 0 is no longer included, the behaviours that are contained in day 0 are now no longer a part of the net. Similarly, in predicting day 23, we use the information from day 2 to day 22. So we've got a moving window of 20 days, which is used for learning for predicting the 21st day. A major problem in load forecasting are that there are very many trends in the data. And among the trends which uh, we have identified are a seasonal trend, a monthly or weekly trend, and uh, these trends make it difficult to model the load forecasting correctly using a net. And the way that we actually uh, utilize, uh, the way we actually tackle this problem of modeling the trends was to initially process the data to model these trends components using exponential smoothing. The expressions that we use for um, modeling the, uh, the uh, trend components, uh, we looked at the trend component for five days ahead. So what you're doing here is saying the trend component is equal to the load five days ago plus a difference which occurred five days ago. We, you know, sort of weighted by the appropriate terms alpha and one minus alpha two. Similarly, this allows you to determine the ten component from five days ago. Here, you're modeling the trend component from two days ago. We also look at modeling the trend component just utilizing the load from the previous day. If we incorporate the trend component using this exponential scheme, then we say that the actual prediction is the predicted load using the net plus the trend component. This method was used to test real data from an Australian utility the data consisted of a total of 45 days. We used a configuration of 38 inputs, one output, and in our study we found that we needed a hidden layer of 10 hidden units which produced the best results. Now the table that we have there shows you some of the results we obtained. Now I show that there, the acronym LM, which actually stands for learning machine, uh, with a simple trend component, a learning machine with an exponential trend component, a multilayer perceptron working on its own, an adaptive multilayer perceptron, and an adaptive multilayer perceptron with exponential trend. Of all those results, you can see the one with the multilayer perceptron with the, exceptional, uh, the exponential trend gives the best result. In order to just look at a few examples, we will run through some typical curves to show you how the uh, load is actually done. This is uh, the prediction of the load for day 21. 
And you can see that during some hours, the load is in fact predicted very accurately. And uh, during other hours, there is in fact an, an error. And we'll run through a series of days just to get a bit of a feel for uh, these. You notice that here we get uh, a somewhat different prediction. Uh, and uh, you notice that the predicted output, again, models this period very correctly. And is, there's an error there at that peak. And that shows a result for day 26 and another one for day 29. You see that in this particular case, the prediction is, is rather good. Running through a couple more quickly, we'll show you one um, for day 45. Again, you notice that there is uh, a, a sharp dip here in the load. And the prediction is not quite able to follow that sharp dip here in day 40. If you look at day 45, we notice there is, in fact, a big difference in the prediction. This day corresponded, actually, to a situation which was not seen in the previous 45 days. It corresponded to a day where there was heavy rain for the preceding three days. And uh, this caused the load to increase significantly because it was a, a winter day. And uh, so the prediction wasn't quite able to follow this sharply increased load. Nevertheless, if you look at it fairly carefully, the, it was able to pick up quite a lot of the shape of the curve, even though there was a big displacement in the actual value. Now, in looking at uh, neural networks for load forecasting, we can actually draw the following conclusions. A, that we think that this is going to be a very effective method for short-term load forecasting. B, that when we do seek to use neural networks uh, for load forecasting, we have to be careful to understand the nature of, of the situation we are trying to model rather than using them in a very naive fashion. If we understand carefully the trend components, if we understand the non-stationary aspects of our particular load that we're trying to model, and separate out those components and treat them effectively, then we are very likely to have a highly successful short-term load forecasting technique. If you approach it very naively, we are likely to be quite disappointed with the results. I believe that this is going to be a method that's going to be widely used in industry. It's already being widely, it's already being used in a number of utilities around the world. It is already being investigated by a large number of utilities and companies as the preferred load forecasting method. And uh, so I'm very positive about this being one of the major areas of application, of successful application of neural networks in power systems.